Right, welcome to another episode of the Old Parachute Podcast, and I'm joined today by a very special guest, uh, retired Major General, former commanding officer of the 2nd Battalion of the Parachute Regiment, Falklands veteran, and my old boss, Chip Chapman. How are you Chip? All right? Uh, hello, Chris. It's great to be on the Old Paratrooper. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Uh, I appreciate it. I'm sure you're a very busy man. Um, so like, what I like to do, it's been, I think it's been... I think 25 years since I saw you last when you was uh, CEO of Two Para, sort of end of the 90s. So it's been a while. <laughs> Fair to say you don't look much different, to be honest. So I- I've got a lot greyer since then. So I don't know what that's about. But um, yeah, so what I like to do with all the guests is start at the beginning, uh, where you grew up, uh, school, uh, and ultimately what led you to join the the unit that you did in the military. Well, I went to a pretty extraordinary school in lots of ways it was uh, an educational experiment it was a bilateral school which really meant it was uh, it took in educational terms those who had passed the 11 plus there was a grammar element to it and there was a non-grammar uh, element to it and this sort of social experiment was the mixing through the the house system and the forms were known as uh, T forms and C forms. I didn't know this until pretty we- uh, recently. So the T forms were territorial. That is, uh, all those who were territorial were from the local catchment area. The C stood for citywide. We were the sort of grammar school folks who were bussed in, really, and we were um, taught separately. Um, the school actually failed, uh, ultimately uh, closed down. And I think there were two reasons for that. Firstly, there was a demographic reason. Um, you know, that there was a shift in the the age profile of people around the area. But actually, the real reason, I think, was they had a tragedy in, I think, 1993, when four sixth formers were killed in a canoeing accident, uh, which had a big health and safety element to it. And the publicity for that really screwed the school. And the school has now uh, been knocked down in the last few years, as was actually my junior school, where they built the um, the A38 through my school. So oh, rather like the army, not only did my schools get knocked down, but a lot of units that I've served in get uh, disbanded apart from the 2nd Battalion, the Parachute Regiment. But um, I was fortunate in that I um, was in sort of fairly good classes. Uh, and I didn't really know how clever I was, I guess, until I was sort of 18. And this is sort of relevant to joining the regiment. So when I was sort of 18 and coming up to do my A-levels, I applied to go to Sandhurst, which would have been a disaster at 18. You know, I was a pretty parochial 18-year-old from a, a, a very ordinary background, really. And to have gone to Sandhurst and then to potentially be let loose on paratry, because if I'd have, if I'd have got through Sandhurst, uh, would have been disastrous. But I did extra- extremely well in my A-levels, so much so that I had the highest grades in the southwest for the liberal arts I did wow. history English and geography and I'd at the same time I'd applied to go to university so I thought hey, maybe I'm pretty clever I'll, I'll go to university and you know blow the army I'll you know see what academic life does for me uh, and I did and actually the army wrote to me then when I was at university because I'd already technically been on their books and was due to, due to go to Sandhurst in September 77 and said, you know, we will give you a, a bursary. They didn't have any cadet ships in the parachute regiment at the time. And the, the only thing that I had to do for that was to join the elite Liverpool University OTC uh, and in the holidays go away with the, the regiment. And uh, the, the time I did that was in Osnabrück in uh, April 79 with three para. And, uh, you know, I always thought I was going to go to three para when I got to the <laughs> The battalion and I ended up going to Tupac and I was extremely disappointed about that at the time which sounds rather ridiculous now because most of my regimental service was done in um, in Tupac I was actually two IC of one para for a short period of time but I never actually served in three power but going to university was good for me in that um, well, obviously I got three years older and therefore maturer uh, and I got to know a lot more one of the courses which stood me in good stead in longer term was a course called uh, War and Society, War and Society, History 205 it was. And um, that was where I first came across, for example, Sir Michael Howard, who was a preeminent military historian. Now, not only 
do you need to be tactically proficient? But obviously, ultimately, if you're going to progress up the ranks, as I did as a commissioned officer, you need to be professional in understanding about your um, your profession. It is a profession of arms. Uh, and General Mattis, who I also worked for, one of the greatest guys I worked for, always used to say that unless you've read a thousand books, you're functionally illiterate. Now, I don't think many of us have ever read a thousand books, but I think really what he was saying was, you know, get on that pathway of continuous learning because uh, it's something that doesn't stop in your life. And it's really what I still do these days. Still do a lot of research because, of course, I kind of make a living, not that I really need to, uh, by appearing on TV and radio on defence um, issues, including, you know, Ukraine and Gaza, Israel and all that sort of stuff. So I left university uh, being competent in how to, knowing how to put on my putties and strip and assemble and SLR and all those sort of functional skills. Uh, and I qualified it, I think, MQ, MQ2 level, military qualification two in the OTC. And actually, I'd done two Cambrian marches during the time at the OTC with Liverpool. Um, so I was pretty fit and, you know, knew how to do the basics uh, and went to university, uh, went to Sandhurst, which really was a disaster in terms of anyone who'd been to the, the, the OTC in those days did a course called POSOC. Uh, I was on POSIT 9, post-university course 9. We only did 17 weeks at Santos before we were kind of let loose at Depot Para to two really? Yeah, and uh, I was really functionally, um, tactically illiterate, really, I guess, uh, in when I came to the regiment. I passed P Company, came to two Para. And in those days, and this plays into this, you'd never get away with this now, um, the parachute regiment didn't serve its uh, send its short service officers those you know those who were had only signed up for three years which is what i had initially to the platoon commander's division what would now be called you know phase two training in uh, in, ta in, t in tactical terms so we just went straight to the uh, the battalion and were you know schooled in what we would call these days ojt on the job training that was it you know that's how we learned we learned by doing the job uh, and the, the, the sort of denouement of all that was that there were seven parachute regiment officers in January 1983 who actually went and did the uh, platoon commander's course. Six of us had already been to war in the Falklands. And wow. surprise, surprise, uh, we all did pretty well on the on the course. In fact, the top two students were myself and another officer in two power called uh, Chris Waddington, who became quite uh, well known for the BBC documentary on the 40th anniversary, sadly, no longer with us, who died in a plane accident last year. So uh, joined Two Power in June 1981, and it was a really exciting first nine months in the uh, battalion. We went to uh, Denmark. In those days, uh, we were in a uh, we were in three formations really in the first nine ten months of my career, which wasn't good at formation level. This is brigade level, and the brigade had actually been. Brigades had been disbanded from the British Army Orba at the time. Uh, we were in six field force and then eight field force. And one of those became five infantry brigade by February 1982. And so the first nine months, we went to Denmark on one of these field force exercises. People who were there would tell you that was the worst exercise in their entire army career. Just oh, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely threw it down with rain, never saw any enemy. Uh, there was a the brigade commander was a guy called Beckett. They had this concept called Beckett's bag. We, we never saw anything about Beckett's bag. We never knew what was going on. It was just a farce. Um, and then we went to Kenya for six weeks uh, in November, December 81. Now, for me, that was pretty seminal in terms of the cohesion and training which was engendered there, in my view, was equivalent to, you know, the sort of Wellington talking about the uh, Waterloo was one on the uh, on the uh, on the playing fields of Eton. I think for two power certainly, the Falklands was partly one on the uh, on the training grounds of Kenya, uh, and then even more extraordinary in um, late March uh, 1982, we were due to go to Belize for six months. Uh, two power, and they sent the officers and the junior officers and a number of the senior NCOs out to Belize to do um, train with in jungle warfare, really, with F Company, which was the Hereford troop uh, who dealt with sort of jungle warfare prior to the battalion coming out. 
and we got there about 21st of March. And actually, the uh, there was a junior officer's coup in Guatemala on the 23rd of March. We actually thought we were going to war. And we thought we were going to go to war with Guatemala because Guatemala had a, uh, a long-standing um, territorial dispute with Belize, the former British Honduras, and had a claim on it. So we were actually quite excited. We said, junior officers coup, the Guatemalans are going to come across the border. We're going to get in a, a bit of a fist, uh, fisticuffs here with the Guatemalans. And we were, we were really up for it. And then we were actually in the jungle with the, the F troop, uh, the Hereford guys, when the Argentinians invaded on the 2nd of, 2nd of April, 82. We only found out on the 4th of uh, April, we were in a bunch of OPs in, in the trees somewhere and suddenly found out that the Argentinians had invaded and bye bye six months in Belize, we were um, flown back straight to uh, the battalion. And we thought that everyone would be, you know, tooled up, ready to go to war. And uh, they were still on leave. We were absolutely disappointed because uh, we weren't technically on the orbit at that time. Uh, three para were uh, joining three commando brigade and it was still unclear whether two para were gonna gonna go or not. But that that pretty that changed pretty quickly. And I think we actually left on the twenty uh, sixth of uh, April for the Falklands. And this is one of the things about the Falklands. The sort of dates are kind of etched into your into your mind really. You know, firstly because it was a short war, but there was also sort of seminal things which happened. So it's very episodic in the way that things happened. And, you know, I was a platoon commander, uh, six platoon, B company, um, two para. And, you know, um, your history and legacy, your battalion is something that you, you get to know about. And, you know, six platoon, two, uh, B company, two para was quite a famous platoon at Arnhem. It was the, the platoon of the Gronach twins, you know, both killed in action on the first day of uh, the Arnhem operation. The platoon commander was killed. Uh, and he lies uh, in the Osterbeek Cemetery, uh, very, very, very close to the Gronach twins. So we were sort of, um, we were conscious of uh, what the battalion we were in was and its history. And that actually does play out later on at the Battle of Goose Green, which uh, I'll, I'll kind of mention probably. Um, so it was pretty episodic. And I think we were very lucky because we went down on um, a converted North Sea ferry called the Norland. And again, that was really good in terms of the cohesion of the battalion we weren't with any other any other units you know three power were on um, the canberra with uh, elements of three commando brigade and uh, you know four two and 40 commando and we were there by ourselves so again people became very very tightly bonded and uh, um you know very close to each other but i think a lot of people thought that it was just going to be a kind of cruising to the, the equator and there'd be a diplomatic solution and uh, we'd all come home uh, I never really took that line. I always thought um, that this would be a problem. And you get all this sort of myth that people say they don't know where the Falklands were and they thought it was an island off the um, off the Shetlands and all that kind of stuff. Well, I absolutely knew where the Falklands were for two good reasons. Uh, the first one is I'd done international relations alongside history at university and I'd followed really from the late 70s the, the diplomatic en passe with Argentina. And secondly, although I only did that terrible 17 weeks at Sandhurst, one of the things we did was a crisis management decision game. Uh, and there are constants in war, why you go to war, you know, they, they don't change in terms of historical, technological, geopolitical, geostrategic, all those sort of aspects. And the country that I've chosen to measure whether there might be a potential war was Argentina and the Falkland Islands. So wow. what the score for a uh, that becoming... A potential war in the future was quite high, uh, which is kind of ridiculous because, it, you know, as you get more senior and when I dealt in high level intelligence when I was a general, uh, you know, the Joint Intelligence Committee is the most senior and preeminent intelligence committee in the, in the UK. And, you know, the Falkland Islands was priority four, you know, so the intelligence coverage in terms of indications and warnings was, you know, right at the bottom of the bottom. So we didn't really have any of the coverage that you would have of countries of major concern these days. So although it wasn't necessarily a strategic shock, and indeed in many ways it was the first SIGINT war, where GCHQ in particular came um, came into their own, um, you know, we were on the back foot because, of course, it's better to deter someone coming across a large um, 
steel water than to actually try and reclaim that from someone else. And the geography of the Falklands vis-a-vis uh, Argentina was also a course of interest. And they generally say that if it had been 100 miles closer to Argentina, the Argentinians would have won and we'd never have gone. If it had been 100, 100 um, miles further away, the Argentinians wouldn't have been able to do it and we would have uh, preserved the islands. And mainly that's to do with um, the distances involved in air power. And one of the four, um, four reasons of the success in land operations in the 20th century was control of the air. And that was always pretty dodgy, of course, in the Falklands. And unlike the campaigns, you know, that you were in, Chris, and most of the modern campaigns, you know, air power mattered in this campaign. You know, we could take a capability holiday against uh, Saddam Hussein. You know, his air, air force would never really got off the ground. The, um, the Taliban never had an air force. So you, you guys never actually saw any enemy air force coming against you. Uh, we did. And uh, therefore, the first really significant date that um, sticks in people's minds and why I say, you know, I knew, always thought we were going to war, and when everyone else thought we were going to war, was the 4th of May, because that's the day that the um, the Sheffield was sunk by the Argentinian Air Force. And we'd gone really from a posture of almost euphoria, because we'd sunk the Belgrano sort of 36 hours before, to this position where, hang on a minute, one of our ships has now been sunk. This is, this is getting a bit real. And that's when I think most people thought, this is it, we're going to go to war. And indeed we were. Uh, and, you know, the closer we got to uh, the Falklands, um, became even more real. And that's why you then get the second significant date that most people remember, which is the 21st of May when two power landed at Blue Beach 2, um, an unopposed landing, which is a great thing to do. And there are reasons that we went to um, that part of the uh, island. You know, it was out of the artillery range of the enemy. Uh, you know, we didn't think that they had the sort of uh, reserves to be able to get that far. And so you could land the force and build the bridgehead prior to the breakout. So in terms of the planning which went on at you know, way above my level, it was a fantastic uh, uh, estimate that they did to actually land, in my view, at uh, San Carlos Water. And everyone will remember Blue Beach too. Anyone you talk to in Two Power that night would remember a number of things. Firstly, we had to wade ashore. And we had massive, massive loads. Everyone was carrying at least 100 pounds. And our feet were wet uh, from the off. And we had to tab up Sussex, to Sussex Mountain. Although technically it wasn't that far, I think it was about 8, 7 or 8K, there were a number of air raid warning reds during the time of the transition from darkness. I think we landed at 2 in the morning, supposed to anyway, uh, to when it got light, a number of air raid warning red. So we kept on having to take cover and the physical effort of actually getting to your feet again after yeah. having to take cover every five, ten minutes was extreme. So everyone was pretty exhausted by the time we actually got to Suffolk Mountain. Um, and the weather was absolutely bleak uh, throughout. You know, you'd have four seasons in a day, you still do. You know, she'd have massive winds at night when it would be difficult to keep a uh, poncho down. Uh, you couldn't dig down very far because of the water table. Uh, and the fact that the tab to Sussex Mountain had been so extreme and everyone had wet feet um, meant that we were going to have problems, and we did. So um, one of my toms was lost to me on the third day with trench foot, and we never saw them again until the end of the war. Uh, and that was not because of incompetence in terms of administration and war and changing your socks and all that. It was just that the climatic conditions were so extreme that yeah. you, your feet just couldn't recover. And, you know, people will always remember what their feet were like uh, in the Falklands War. And it came home to me, really, on the um, on the 14th of June, which is also a significant date of the surrender, when I sort of flopped down in a garden at Ross Road West in Stanley. And Chris Keeble, who's 2IC of 2 Para, came along and he said, how is it? And I said, I didn't re realise liberation would be so um, so uh, difficult for my feet because my feet had told me, that's it, you've abused us for too long, now we're going to get our own back. And I just, my feet were in rag order. Uh, but you just, you know, you had to keep going, really. You, know, you knew that you had to keep going, particularly as a leader. And I think it's also significant that 
Uh, if I look at, and I have, I've got all the casualty figures of the two para, including both the um, those who were wounded in action and those who were out of the orbit for either frostbite or trench foot. And most of the guys who were lost were the young, uh, young Toms. And I think partly that was psychological as well as physical, because there were a number of Toms who got to the battalion, you know, literally a week before we uh, went, came straight out of the factory. Now, I'm not saying they were the ones who necessarily went down, but they were the ones who weren't necessarily as bonded as some of the older Toms and you know, those in the chain of command. And there are quite a few of those who went down. Uh, and also, it was an interesting correlation because two power had to fight two battles. And some of them were a bit edgy after the first battle. And I think some of them, you know, not everyone's a hero, uh, took that opportunity to say, I can use my feet as an excuse and went sick. Uh, and I always really say that there are three types of people in war. There are thrivers, those who quite enjoy what they're doing. There are stickers, those who get on with it regardless. And there are... Um, and there are kind of losers. Uh, and I'm not saying losers, in, you know, because they're losers, but um, those who can't, you know, can't really stick what is going on. And there's no reason they should, because war is a pretty aberrant thing. You know, being shot at and shelled and uh, having aircraft attack you is is not a normal condition. Uh, you know, and we often forget that in kind of training. So it's quite right that some people will not, you know, <laughs> thrive in that environment. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. The, the, so the twenty. 21st of um, May is a, a significant date. And the next significant date is, of course, the Battle of Goose Green. And, I, you know, I did a long career in the Army, uh, 33 years. But, you know, 28th of May is the day which I always return to, really, as, uh, as the date that I came of age and really which informed all my views on, uh, on what you should be as a leader and, and fighting, uh, because the blokes were brilliant. And... You know, there were only three things that mattered, cohesion, cohesion, cohesion. That's what I tried to bring to the party in the future. And it also informed my views on kind of mission command, really. There's an interesting one at the O Group. So like all these things, the, the battle procedure didn't really work out as it kind of should. Um, Battalion HQ uh, consumed most of the time in terms of battle procedure. So at platoon level, we got our orders very, very late. It was very, very dark, and we had very little time to disseminate those orders before uh, we had to go to the start line, really. So it literally was um, get everyone together in platoon, you know, your left forward, your right forward, you're in reserve. Uh, there's a track uh, on the left, that's a boundary. Uh, we'll treat this as a advance to contact. Anything that gets in the way, get rid of it. That's kind of really what, <laughs> what it boiled down to and what I gave to the blokes. And I think that actually gave them bit more freedom because it was a very very complicated six phase operation at the sort of higher level uh, which didn't translate very well in terms of you know when the enemy start firing at you and really mess up the what was quite a timetable tabled sort of set of orders you know you sort of phase two would happen at zero six phase three at zero seven phase four at zero eight, and it was just not going to work like that and uh, the, the whole thing was shot to bits pretty early on in terms of the um, both the templated timetable and the approach to a sort of mechanistic uh, way that uh, the battle might actually end up. Um, so uh, it was a good thing that we got our orders late uh, but the thing I really learned quite early on we we were I think the battalion was really successful when it was dark uh, we owned the night. Uh, but the transition to daylight was the real problem uh, that we had because we hadn't got the, the, the notion was, and my company commander, who was a great, great charismatic leader called um, John Crossland, um, you know, the, the notion that he told us that, you know, we're going to have General Menendez's balls on the end of our barrel by breakfast. You know, we were going to be in Goose Green and successful by breakfast, which uh, was sort of 11.30 in the morning because we were on Zulu time. Uh, so all the timings were Zulu times, which was four hours different. So we attacked at two in the morning, uh, which was on our watches was six in the morning. It was all confusing like that. And it would get light between 10.30 and 11 because of the difference between Zulu time and, and local time. And we were nowhere near, uh, anywhere near that by the time it was light. And that's when I kind of first had my, first problems on uh, 
the gorse line at uh, Bocker House, where we'd been pretty successful up until then. We were the first guys in contact with the enemy in terms of killing some of the enemy, actually, at a, uh, at a base called Low Pass. And it was euphoric in lots of ways because we... Um, we'd done all this damage to the enemy and we hadn't taken any casualties in my platoon. So I actually, I thought from that moment on that we would win this battle. We'd established our dominance over the enemy very early on from that initial engagement. And I just didn't think that we could uh, be defeated from that moment on. That never kind of left me. But when it got light, we were um, skirmishing our forward slope really down to the gorse line at Bocker House under quite heavy fire. And um, we managed to get there without any casualties as well. But, you know, did a quick estimate. There was just no way I could exploit forward to do anything about that position just with the platoon without getting lots of people killed. You know, you needed other assets to be brought to bear to be successful there. And the one mistake I made then was um, actually I was in a pretty good position because although we were kind of pinned down on the gorse line, the gorse line was very thick. So we kind of had cover from cover from view and cover from fire from the enemy. And we could continue to apply pressure on the enemy. Now, momentum is often wrongly understood, in my view. A lot of people think momentum is continuous forward motion. It's not. It's continuous pressure on the enemy. And we could apply that pressure. So, you know, you could still fire it in from where we were uh, without exposing yourself. And that was, should have been good enough before other assets could be brought up to bear, which eventually were going to be Milan missiles to have a conversation with the enemy bunkers, and uh, and they didn't like that conversation. But my company commander, who I said is a great guy, and I, you know, and I still believe that true, told me to withdraw. And to withdraw, of course, I had to uh, expose the platoon again on forward slope. And I should have said, no, I'm in a good position. I can continue to apply uh, momentum on, you know, uh, pressure on the enemy. Uh, but I didn't, uh, you know obedience to orders was kind of one of those things that's kind of drilled into you so we did it and you know we were heavily engaged by the enemy and um one of the corporals gas majerison well known got hit a couple of times but hit in the sort of face hit in the shoulder and was in a pretty bad way uh, and then the uh the milan missiles had the conversation with the enemy and d company rolled up from the flank uh to um ultimately take them out and the reason I tell that story is not any criticism of anyone in the chain of command above me. It's because that actually led to one of the things I always passionately believed when I was CO2 para, which was uh, I'm a passionate believer in mission command, and you should follow the intent two levels up, not one level up, if the situation demands it. And that's why when I was CO2 para, I really only did two things. And um, I did all junior officer education myself. So all the subalterns, I did all that education myself to teach them how I, what I believed and how I thought so that if the situation demanded it from them in the future, they would know to follow my intent. And the second thing I did uh, was ruthlessly train the uh, battalion HQ uh, because if they could plan well, you always know that the companies are commanded by decent blokes who are going to sort things out. So if you give them something which is worthwhile and include them in the planning, because if they're going to get killed, you're the one who's told them to do that, then try and include them. So you know, are you comfortable with what we're telling you to do? Or do you believe in what we're telling you to do? Or have we, or have we missed something? Now, as a result of my experiences at Goose Green, I never really carried a, um, a rifle when I was CEO. I carried a pistol. Uh, as a psychological and physical reminder of my job as CO, is command in the widest sense to bring all the assets that you can bring to bear on the enemy, not to, you know, be a junior officer. So that's what I tried to do as a CO. And of course, I had the privilege, um, along with you, I think, Chris, to, you know, I was the first CO outside of Northern Ireland of two power to command since um, the Falklands in the Macedonia operation. Uh, right, Macedonia, yeah. The Macedonia operation wasn't a kinetic operation. We didn't know really at the time we went there whether it was going to be, but it was a, a good operation in terms of the strategic outcome. So um, although it's a sort of very 
small footnote to history now. It was one of those operations which I think everyone in Two Power could be uh, immensely proud with. Proud with. Anyway, back to the 28th of May 1982. So we, everyone was now departing from the orders anyway in terms of uh, the CEO had been killed. Um, everyone, you know, company commanders, 2IC, who'd stepped off, Chris Keeble. How, how, was, how was, sorry, how, how was morale on hearing of the death of the, the CEO? How did that kind of... I, my own personal view from where I was is that I didn't really intimately know about it in the way that everyone seems to think that it went like a wildfire around the battalion and uh, this galvanized us and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's to me, that's a bit of a myth. Right. You know, it was a fairly dispersed battlefield. Uh, we all had our problems at the time. Um, your focus wasn't on the CO, it was on the enemy. Um, and I think one of the great things which does um, then happen is kind of this kind of freed up. And the thing that we did, which is not really adequately explained, I think, in lots of books, is B Company then did this big hook around the sort of rear of um, rear of Goose Green. It wasn't in the original orders. Now, that was absolutely, in my view, the manoeuvrist approach to unhinging the enemy. But the fact that we got to the rear of the enemy was part of the thing which destroyed the will of the enemy to resist. Now, we didn't know it at the time. We couldn't touch that. Whether that was a conscious thing, I don't know. Um, but there's a number of things which indicate that. Now, I mentioned earlier on that um, I did a course called History 205, and I men mentioned some Michael Howard. And I learned three things, really, from him in war. Um, two of them are relevant here. So one of the things he said is that there's two parts to war. A mechanistic part which can be learned you can learn your section battle drills or your platoon battle drills or whatever the 10 principles of war are so a mechanistic part which can be learned and the understanding of war which may not and to understand about how to break the enemy's will by the sort of maneuverist approach and doing the unexpected is is one of those intangibles which is often difficult to you know teach uh, but this sort of hook around the back of Goose Green was one of those psychological things which unhinged the enemy. Uh, and at the same time, the enemy could be unhinging us, you know. So one of the things which happened when we'd got very close or had already done this maneuver around the back, and it was getting quite late in the light of the day. So it's probably about, I don't know, four, four thirty. And the thing about Goose Green is it just went like a flash. I mean, you know, the whole thing was just Time just went really fast. Uh, I don't remember ever looking at my watch. Um, and so three things happen simultaneously, which plays into this physical and psychological part. So the first thing was that we were heavily opened up on and shelled and fired, was, uh, opened up on with small arms fire and shelled by the enemy. So that was a physical thing. The second thing is the casualty figures started coming in on the radio. And Bizarrely, because people who go to Goose Green think it's tiny, you know, when they you, when you're walking around. Um, but I don't remember ever seeing any other company uh, there, so we were kind of isolated. And so the casualties figures figures came in, and they kind of my memory is that it said that we'd had seven officers killed, and I thought, wow, we had seven officers killed. There's about 25 in the front line. How many of the blokes were killed? We must be the only company left. So that was a psychological thing on us. And the third thing was uh, a bunch of enemy helicopters came in with reinforcements, their strategic reserve. Now, for me, that was both physical and psychological. The physical thing was you're seeing a bunch of enemy helicopters yeah. arriving with reinforcements. And the second one, which was psychological, is we'd actually been towed somewhere uh, between the 21st and 28th of May that there were no enemy helicopters left on the islands. It had all been shot down. Suddenly, we're seeing this fleet of um, helicopters come in with all this reinforcement. So that put us absolutely, B Company, in my view, on the back foot. Up to that point, we'd always been on the sort of tactical offensive with pauses. And people were literally digging in with kind of mess tins and uh, spoons and stuff. We, we've had some enemy trenches that we kind of occupied, but it weren't enough. 
we really expected a uh, counterattack from this force which had come in. It was their strategic reserve from Mount Ken. But that manoeuvre, our manoeuvre, and the fact that the other companies were um, going to tighten their own strangulation on the, uh, on the enemy meant that that force was actually dislocated itself because of what B Company had done. And they didn't attack. They all went to the bag next morning uh, with the rest when they surrendered. Now, I knew nothing about those negotiations that were going on, you know, later in that, that evening. And, you know, it was on tenter hooks and with matchsticks keeping my um, eyes open sort of thing because we were really, really tired, really tired. And we had no sleep really for about three days. And the, the time from um, being at Bocker House where the battle procedure was, and it was freezing, uh, we didn't have any sleeping bags for three days. We didn't have any Bergens. It was just a, a fighting order. Yeah. Really tired. So when they surrendered the next day it was um you know a real surprise to me but you know absolutely the blokes were just fabulous um you know to a man uh and i got most highest regard for them from that moment onwards really uh and loved them to death from that moment onward that doesn't mean of course as a commander and a leader that you have this messianic devotion to them because the toms mess up as we all know you still need a disciplined force uh, to take those things to into account. And of course, uh, in your time, Chris, I had some great headlines uh, in national newspapers. Um, racist paras made my life hell. And <laughs> animal, animal paras banned from pubs in Colchester. Remember that one, Paul? <laughs> like all these things, it's not the headlines. It's how you deal with them, which is the most important thing. And we kind of generally dealt with them pretty well. Um, and uh, it was a terrific battalion uh, which I still love to death today and what's interesting is is later on of course I went I commanded a, a, a brigade it was a non-airborne brigade 19 brigade and I you know I'd always been in the airborne world really in you know parachute regiment uh, units and five airborne brigade and I just thought the army was all the same I thought they were all like us you know highly mot motivated fit all those things and it wasn't uh, a lot of units were demotivated you know, a lot of them couldn't pass anything. Um, a lot of sick at homes, you know, not motivated soldiers. It was, this was a new world to me. It wasn't the world I was kind of used to. Um, so I don't think we understand in the sort of airborne world how privileged we are, both as commanders to command, you know, motivated guys. That's why so many go to Hereford, for uh, example. And, and to have the guys who are like that. Uh, and there's a sort of extraordinary leadership thing here in a way, because... Um, we also get pretty decent leaders most of the time in the parachute regiment and the officer corps. And certainly in, at Sandhurst, not in my time, of course, because you got me and I was really average. Um, the, um, we only take, I think, the sort of top third and they've got to be fit and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and actually, you want your best leaders in those terrible units to motivate those really demotivated, not very good soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be easy to have pretty poor officers in uh, the parachute regiment because of the motivation of everyone else. So we've, the balance is, um, is is interesting to observe when you've been in the wider world like I was, where I'd love to have had parachute regiment officers in one loam shoes, not to quote a real unit, which would have made a real difference. And um, it does make a difference because if you I always quote sort of um, slim here, so Slim says there were four great commands in the world. Anytime you're in command is great. Uh, a platoon, because you're young, and if you're any good, you know the blokes as well as their mothers and love them as much. And, of course, that is true, particularly if you go to war with them. A battalion, because it's got a life of its own. Whether it's any good is down to you and you alone. And that is also true. Um, so, you know, a battalion is shaped by who the boss is at the top at all times. And I've also served in a foreign army where the leadership at that uh, unit was awful. And that came to roost when it was disbanded a few years after I left that unit for heinous crimes that they got up to uh, on operations elsewhere. So leadership does really matter. Now, of course, Slim, other four great commands are a division and an army, but very few people are ever going to command those and war in the British Army these days. Um, so... I wasn't really competent, that very competent when I was a platoon commander. But the only thing Sandhurst had taught me, I remember I hadn't been to the platoon commanders, commanders division, 
was really how to do platoon attacks. So that's all I've been taught. And that's all really I had to do in the forwards, do platoon attacks. And I was pretty good at doing that. So that kind of saved my career. And so I went from a position of being consciously incompetent to ultimately being consciously competent. Uh, but I stayed in um, I stayed in two para until May 1985. I commanded the machine gun platoon for nearly three years, where I did do the platoon commander's division when I was machine gun platoon commander, not the, uh, the rifle uh, platoon. And uh, had a decent bunch of lads who I still love. Uh, we were in Belize in for six months in 1983, and you know I had the privilege of um, being OC Fork Hill in Northern Ireland with them in '84, which was my first. Um, Northern Ireland tour but the real key thing for me in becoming I think professionally competent um, was I followed that by going to the platoon commanders division to be an instructor on the on the platoon commanders battle course and the thing which was the seminal moment for me in my thirst for real knowledge and understanding the profession of arms was I was taking over from a light infantry captain uh, and I had two weeks when I was sitting at the back of the classroom on a TA course that he was teaching. And uh, he was really, really good instructor, I thought. And uh, I was thinking to myself, I don't really know 80% of the stuff he's talking about. And I went away and I read every tactical pamphlet in the army and you know, the wider reading about the profession of arms. And I always say that that was the moment that I became, you know, really professionally competent and proficient. From that moment on, I was always going to do continuous professional development to try and succeed in this, you know, profession of arms. And uh, was fortunate enough to kind of do that without being ruthlessly ambitious. I was never really ambitious. I, as I said, I was only on for a three-year short service commission. I then extended that by two years, and then I converted to a regular commission. But I absolutely enjoyed every day in the. Uh, in the army, I didn't really. There's not one day I could say a succession of days together when I, you know, didn't like being in the army. I did, and I went to some interesting places and I met interesting people. And every day was a kind of joy to behold, really. In, even in those moments when you thought, you know, there's certain problems I can't fix. In two power, there was. Um, you, I won't quote the uh, the name of the guy, but there was one guy who was a particular problem for me. Uh, which we did have to go to a, um, well, I did have to go to an employment tribunal uh, for. Not that I was guilty of anything, but you know, buck stops with you as the leader. Uh, and I thought to myself, you know, I thought I was a pretty good leader, and I can't, I can't sort this out. But I'm actually also very proud of that incident, not because it came to you know an employment tribunal, but the Treasury solicitors wanted us to settle out of court, fence to settle out of court, and um, give him. Um, Seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds, and I kind of said, "You can't do that. We did nothing wrong. You need to contest this." And we actually won the case, and he got nothing. And we won it. This is the key lesson here: not because bad things didn't happen to this guy, because they absolutely did, but the key thing was: did we have the processes in place to try and put this right? And the answer was we did. And that was also a thing I learnt uh, in retrospect: a key phrase from General Mattis. You know, if you've got good people and bad process, bad process wins nine times out of ten. We actually in two power had good process and therefore good process allied to good people means that you've always got a chance of success in both the managerial sphere along with the tactical sphere. So I'm actually quite proud of the outcome of that just because we did um, we did win. It wasn't great that uh, a Tom was lost to us, uh, but for various reasons, I don't think he wanted to be uh, around the battalion. So any loss of manpower is great, and you'll know the incident, I think, I'm talking I, about. I do, yeah. I was, I was trying to run it through my head then, but yeah, I think I remember the incident, yeah. Uh, and I won't, you know, I won't uh, give his name or anything, but, you know, we we were, you know, you got to always try and do the right thing. We didn't necessarily do the right, you know, people walked past things they shouldn't have maybe in the lower chain of command but we i was i was proud that and i'd already been promoted the uh, full colonel i wasn't in two power when this all came to a employment tribunal but we we kind of won the case it was uh, you know you're never going to win in the sort of court of the newspapers and that's why 
the press can be difficult because the first day he was in court, it was the headline, racist powers made my life hell. When we won, there was nothing in the uh, newspapers at all about the fact that we'd uh, been successful in the outcome of the uh, employment tribunal, which was a bit disconcerting. Um, but, um, you know, that, that was a, a good incident to understand about, you know, having good processes is a, a good thing. And um, and not necessarily all units do that. So, for uh, for example, when I was 2IC of one para, and I was only there for a short time, really, about seven months, I'd already been selected for promotion to Lieutenant Colonel. Uh, but they'd, they'd already moved at that time, and this is way before the SFSG role, into New Normandy Barracks in Aldershot at the time. And I arrived there, and one power actually at that time, I'd never served in one power then, this is 96, were very, very fit, you know, lots of dash and land, very fit battalion, again, a product of a CO, you know, fanatical physical fitness guy. Uh, but I didn't really know how they do did business because they, you know, they had a lack of standing orders and security standing orders and all the rest of the stuff. Uh, and so I've never worked as hard in my life. I had to write them all. And so it was <laughs> the seven months when I, I had to work really hard writing all these damn documents because it hadn't been done before. So uh, thanks, one para. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was that when they were, they were at North Camp in Aldershot? They were. New Normandy Barracks was um, up Queen's Avenue on the right-hand side as you're on your way to North Camp. Uh, and then I went off to um, Staff College to be an instructor there. And, you know, again, I then I, I became very good at instructing. And, of course, that's when I got really interested in... Um, you know, the nature of war and strategy and all those kinds of things. And really from that time on, I most of my career, apart from the two power things, were mainly in the sort of counter-terrorist um, atmosphere or sphere, not just um, Northern Ireland, but after 9-11 in 2001, which of course happened when we were in Macedonia, that absolutely shaped my um, career from there on in, because when I left two power, I became Thing called Colonel MO2, and I was put there really because I'd had lots and lots of Northern Ireland experience, both on the staff and in command there. And people thought that was translatable to these bad guys of Al Qaeda at the time, uh, and it did. And you know, so when I was there, for example, I uh, had some time in Gaza and the West Bank and doing stuff with the Israelis, trying to do confidence building measures and. That's kind of relevant to some of the stuff you see now because there was a particular time we were there and we thought we were doing some good stuff and we'd bring the two sides together. And there were three of us and we'd just gone down to the Wailing Wall in um, in Jerusalem. We were making our way up to this hotel we were staying at. And we were about, I don't know, 150 metres from a huge uh, bus bomb which killed a load of people. We just looked at each other and said, waste of time what we're doing now. The Israelis will just have a big stick and go, Bang, 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 and that's what they did. So, and I went to some really interesting places that you also see now. You know, so I went to Yemen a few times and met at the time. You know, I met two of the presidents. I've only really been two and a half presidents in Yemen, and that's relevant as well because one of those was a foreign minister at the time called Hardy. This was about 2009. Now, uh, who I was head of counterterrorism and UK ops at the time. And I always remember this uh, because you you all know their name now. He said to me, uh, the Houthi are the Hezbollah of the north, the north of Yemen in terms of the governorate of Sada. Uh, they even have the same flag. And that stuck with me. And now, you know, you see and hear the Houthis all the time in terms of the, what's happening in the Red Sea. And I guess my last few years in the army, I had the privilege of serving at uh, Central Command, which, of course, was the, is the largest at the time or well, still is really the most active combatant command in America. General Mattis had 190,000 troops under his command and his wow. area of responsibilities at the time, which of course included both Afghanistan and um, and uh, Iraq, as, uh, as well as you know Yemen, Iran, all the stands and everything else. That's the problem. And he was he was actually a quite a close friend of um, I'm not sure why with Tony Blair. And he, every time he used to come to England, he used to see Tony Blair. And the first time I came over with him, he, uh, I think he was seeing, oh, seeing Tony Blair and, uh, and Tony Blair said, uh, if you can't ride f uh, five horses uh, at the same time in, in the circus tent, you know, get out of the Middle East. And that is the kind of real conundrum and problem which confronts 
any CENTCOM commander and any strategist these days with the multiplicity of problems that are uh, abundant, really, in the in the region at the moment. Not that I think there will be a regional conflagration and a regional war, but all this notion that um, the Americans were going to get out of the Middle East and that the axis of the Middle East had changed with the um, the rapprochement in May, uh, sorry, March 23 between uh, Iran and um, Iran and Saudi Arabia that had been brokered by the Chinese and that we were living in a post-US Middle East period is way off the mark, in my opinion, at the moment. So, you know, war will endure. And it was Plato, I think, who said that only the dead have seen the last of war. Um, you know, the reasons for people going to war are still there. Wars are fought for political reasons, not because people like you and me in um, in uniform wanted them to happen. And the only amelioration for um, for all this is good politics and good statecraft. So mm. let's keep our fingers crossed for good politics and good statecraft. I hope that 2024, 2025 is more peaceful than the last two or three years have been. I think I'm too old now to be called up. So it's, um, uh, and I'm certainly not fit enough anymore. So, <laughs> so uh, what, when did you retire, boss? What year? Well, I retired from the army in 2000 and 13 and right. I I um I was employed by the home office actually in 2014 well the first thing I did was write a book of course because I thought if I write a book I might uh, get involved in sort of defense commentary and things like that that didn't happen straight away actually and, uh, but that was part of the catalyst for me writing a book and uh, I, and also because I thought I had something to say which might be of interest in called notes from a small military and uh, it's done very well still sells mainly because when i go on a times radio front line once a month they always say in a long long 30 minute interview that i wrote this book and someone buys it um so it still sells which i'm very proud of and it went into paperback which is also an objective and you should always have objectives in anything you do uh, and i went into the home office and i was um i was employed to do an independent review of police discipline in england and wales and it was a big bit of work uh was laid before Parliament and I, I did a lot of work on it and it was very unusual for a, a government report that I actually wrote it. <laughs> Normally civil servants write it and there's a particular style in it which people um, see that it wasn't written by the bureaucrats of the Home Office uh, and they paid me a lot of money for that but at the end of it and uh, I had a very tight timeline it was quite stressful I thought I need to do this anymore so I said I'm not going to work for anyone anymore. Uh, I was I wasn't really in a position where I thought I'd be a good follower anymore. You know, I'd always been a fairly good leader, but I didn't think I could be a good follower. But I wanted to be independent, so really self-employed. Um, and that's really what I did from 2015 onwards. And I've been, you know, great, at, uh, been lucky to uh, do things that I like in terms of co uh, commentary about defence issues and war um, to make enough money to, you know, have the kind of lifestyle I want. And I think that's also relevant because one of the, when I was at university, uh, there was always books of their time. The three books of their time and my time at university were um, Catcher in the Rye by Salinger, uh, an, an unreadable book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert M. Persig, and um, Catch-22 by Joseph Heller. And I always say there are two types of people in the world, those who've read Catch-22 and those who haven't. And... Joseph Heller, the author of Catch-22, is at a um, drinks party and he's with Kurt Vonnegut, a very famous author, and Kurt says to him, you see that guy over in the corner there? He's earned more this month than you have from all the royalties of your book, Catch-22, the multi-million selling book. Kurt says to, uh, or, uh, Joseph Heller says to Kurt, yeah, but I, he's a hedge fund guy, this guy, by the way, so he's worth a billion, billion quid, the other guy. And um, Joseph Heller says to Kurt, yeah, but I've got something that he hasn't, and that is enough. And that's really what I've had since I left the army and from being self-employed. I have enough. And, you know, that's a, a good position to be in for anyone. If we've all got enough, that's a fine place to be in as long as you've got your health. Absolutely, it is. And it's like, say, you get comfortable with the lifestyle and you, you make it work for you, don't you, So You do.
Yeah, happy days. Well, it, like your career's been massively varied. So, what have you got? Have you got anything coming up lined up in the next sort of? I, I know you mentioned a trip like, away to, to Australia shortly. Or, well, I'm very fortunate in that um, I think they've now changed the pension system again. So yeah. I've only, I've only um, the key thing is today is the 18th. Is it 18th of March? It's yeah. actually my. Um, my birthday coming up in nine days time and uh because of the pension scheme that i went to i changed from the uh, armed forces pension scheme 77 to 93 when you could opt i get a nice tax-free um payout in nine days time so if i die in seven days time i won't get it and my wife's going to put me in a freezer for two days and tell them i died on the ninth or tenth day um, so I'm going to get a nice pair. I'm just going to go and travel the world, which commences on the 4th of April with five weeks in um, in Australia and probably Petra later in the year. And in June, I've got two weeks where I'm lecturing on a cruise ship, which is three uh, doing lectures on D-Day 80th. Uh, one of them, of course, is about airborne forces in the left and right flanks uh, involving both 6th Airborne Division. 82nd and 101st Division. And again, it's a great position to be in where you can be employed on cruise ships, doing something you love, telling people about uh, aren't the armed forces and um, you know what we did in the glorious days of 1944 with uh, in the airborne world and those who came in by sea as well. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like you've got it sorted. Travel is definitely the way forward, so I can't fault you on that one. But no, absolutely brilliant. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, I won't keep any more of your time, but again, I'll have a chat with you uh, briefly off off air in a second. But thank you very much, and no, well, I yes. I wish you all well in the future, Chip. Thank you very much. <laughs>